I, it's not really a conscious effort. Um, I'm obsessed with libertarianism. And so when I'm doing comedy, it just kind of comes out. And having the perspective of being an anarcho-capitalist, it gives me a different angle than just about any other comedian has on the topic of politics or government or even culture. Um, and there's just a lot of golden material there. Uh, there's nothing that, that's more absurd and hilarious than the idea of the state. And it's something that everybody accepts. And that's like comedy gold, something that everybody accepts that is absurd. That's, that's like the, the best thing a comedian could find is something that nobody's really thinking about that we all accept that is completely contradictory. I mean, like the state is, it's an organization that says we will protect you from thieves, but we're going to have to steal half your money in order to do it. It's, it's just, it's a, it's, it's a comedy gold mine. And that really in, in 2016, when it was the, the show between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, it really gave me this advantage um, whereas everybody was was thinking about politics, but I feel like I it's like libertarianism gives you these superpowers where you can see things in a different way than other people can. And so I was able to kind of have different angles and different takes than any other comedian that I heard talking about it. The quality would be way up. The cost would be substantially lower in five years. In 10 years, poor people would get better health care than rich people get today. And I, that's an assertion or a prediction, but it is very well grounded in reality. Health care is a technology-based uh, um, industry. And what do technology-based industries do when left to the free market? They drastically improve. Uh, the quality goes up. The cost goes down. I mean, you, you, know, you, you think about the iPhone that I have in, in my pocket cost about the same as my mother, uh, you know, you know, spent on a calculator when she was going to to college. This the calculator is the least of what my iPhone does. It's that you would be looking at a world, you know, that would be that we probably can't even comprehend. Uh, every incident was especially authoritarian. I mean, that was the nature of them all. I I'm, I'm trying to think. I remember one um, time that a cop said to a friend of mine he he caught a friend of mine we were 14 and he said he said he smelled weed and we actually weren't smoking weed and i've you know he could have easily caught us like an hour later and we probably would have been but we weren't smoking weed and my friend was really scared and he got in his face and put a flashlight right in his face and he said are you scared i want to watch you piss your pants in front of me to a 14 year old child um, one other incident that just comes to mind is that this guy was, uh, we were sitting on a stoop. This is in Brooklyn. There's stoops uh, out front, uh, outside of people's homes. And this cop said, I'm going in to search your, uh, your house. And, um, he started walking in to search. And then one of my friends said, Hey, don't you need a warrant for that? And he runs up to him uh, and he puts a flashlight in his face. That's their go-to move. Puts a flashlight in his face and he goes, what's your name? Where, what's your address? Let, ask him a whole bunch of questions and he answered them and he goes, all right, and they leave. And I remember really being blown away going like, man, if he hadn't asked that question, they were just going in the house. And they probably would have lied later and said they consented or something like that. Lord Acton, uh, the power corrupts and, and uh, uh, that's, that's the nature of the game. And th these people are... It, a pretty close state to absolute power uh, in the dynamic of a cop, particularly a cop with a teenager, but in general a cop. I mean, what, you know, what, you know, like even things will be like, well, I didn't consent to that search. Well, what happens if a cop says in court you did? It's your word against the cops. Who are they going to side with? They side with the cop every time. So there's two dynamics. There's one that power corrupts. Um, and so you give people this power. None of us do well. Even really good, you know, it's like Lord of the Rings. Even a really good anarchist, if given this power, would be very, very likely to be corrupted. Uh, the only, you know, there's Ron Paul is like the only one who wasn't. And everybody else who's given power is corrupted. Even pretty good libertarian politicians end up getting corrupted at some point. And then the other factor is that who, who gets drawn in to be a cop? I mean, not everybody is is drawn to being a police officer because they have these evil tendencies. 
but it certainly is a magnet for people who do have evil authoritarian tendencies. I mean, if you were, if you wanted to rule over your fellow man, uh, if you wanted to abuse authority, being a police officer is not a bad position to go. And everybody kind of knows this. Everyone knows it's like the kid who didn't get picked for the football team, then goes and becomes a cop and starts busting kids for weed. I mean, this is like, everybody knows this in, in, their, in their gut. I think it's the whole thing. I think I think the whole thing is a, is a culture. Look, if you y politics is very much downstream from from culture, and that's not an absolute truth, but it's there's a lot of truth to it. And if you look at say um, uh, Obama in 2008, his position on gay marriage was like, well, I it's my deep rooted belief in Jesus and the Bible, and that's why marriage is between a man and a woman because it was like 56 percent of people were against gay marriage. And then, in 2012, when like 52% of people were for gay marriage, it's like, yeah, you know, I've thought about it, and I, I support gay marriage. It has nothing to do with that. They're just, they're just playing to the, the people and what people will accept. And what happened is the culture shifted, and then the politics followed. And if you see the, the culture that's being created right now on college campuses and Hollywood, uh, that, is, that is a culture that is incompatible with liberty. They cannot both exist. If you believe in equity, you can't believe in liberty. Then you'll never support uh, uh, any move toward a, a, liber a libertarian society. I, I am very convinced it would be more culturally conservative. Um, I used to think it would be more libertine. I think that's like kind of the level one thought. You come in and you go, well, if, if drugs weren't illegal, more people would do drugs. If, you know, if, if things weren't enforced by the law, people could do whatever they want to. But the truth is that I think that statism always supports degeneracy because it removes the consequences. Um, I, I think in general, uh, my, my guess would be in, in an anarchist society, there would be more libertine groups and more socially conservative groups. But overall, I think that if you stopped subsidizing uh, libertine lifestyles, more and more people would face the free market consequences of those actions. And it'd end up being like, hey, it's real nice to smoke pot and run around naked in a field, but you know, I kind of want to have a nice home at the end of the day, so I'm going to go get a job, or I'm going to get married because we kind of got to raise these kids together. It, it's, it, it's not going to work as well if you don't have the state interfering. Uh, um, the welfare state, I think, I, I mean, look, what is the nature of the state if not taking from people who produce and giving to people who don't produce. So if you reverse that, where are the incentives going to line up? Um, the number one issue is, is war and peace. I mean, there's nothing that comes close to that. I mean, if, if you want a society that, that's based around any type of morality or the non-aggression principle or anything that libertarians and anarchists care about, there's, there's n no worse violation of all of that than mass murder. There's also nothing that um, incentivizes the state to grow faster than war. There, there's, never, there's no time in human history where you see more overreaching status policies than at, at wartime. And, um, and it's just the most evil uh, policy. It's, it's, you know, there's just in, in my lifetime, there's millions have been killed by just U.S. NATO-led wars. Forget the other wars that go on around the world. So the ending the warfare state and really what's very linked with that is, is, um, is central banking. And, and, you know, the Federal Reserve here in the United States of America and central banks all around the world. I mean, there's, you don't have a warfare state without central banking. Every time a state goes for a prolonged war, they always get off any uh, commodity-backed uh, currency. And these things are all connected. So I would say what libertarians should focus on is their most important issues are end the wars, end the Fed. Ron Paul was right again. What a shocker. Um... Because if why not minarchism, why not communism? I mean, there's no, everybody's a minarchist, you know, who's not an anarchist. Joseph Stalin was a minarchist. Bernie Sanders is a minarchist. If you're just going to say, well, I think the state should do X, Y, Z, well, why not X, Y, Z and A, B, C? And while we're at it, E, F, G and a whole bunch of other things. I mean, either you're, you're guided by first principles or you're not. 
and you're just in the realm of preferences. And, you know, anarchists get accused of being utopian, but there is nothing more utopian than a minarchist. Uh, the idea that a state will stay restrained because it just decides it doesn't want more power. We're going to create a monopoly on the initiation of violence, and they'll probably decide we'll only stay, you know, a certain reasonable size. Well, I mean, how, how much empirical evidence do you need to disprove the, the idea that that's even possible? And in fact, there's a pretty strong correlation between relatively small states becoming the biggest states. It's not a coincidence that the United States of America, which started as this experiment in restrained government, uh, with all these brilliant thinkers who wrote all about checks and balances and divisions of power, well, now it's the biggest state that's ever uh, existed in the history of humanity. And it's specifically because it was such a constrained state that we built up so much wealth that there's then this huge tax base and then the state can grow big. So it's, it's, you know, it's why not a little state is like, why not a little bit of cancer? You want to remove the whole thing. I can answer that in one Prussian word, school. Um, you know, can I steal from Tom Woods? Is that okay? So as the great Tom Woods always says, it's my favorite analogy ever. Um, he said, well, imagine Walmart ran all the schools and uh, uh, you had to send your kids to a, a, an institution run by Walmart. And every morning they had to pledge allegiance to Walmart and you had pictures of all the Walmart CEOs all around the room and they would tell you all these fantastic you know tales of well the first Walmart CEO never told the lie and you know like all this just the outright lies and propaganda and then you had a society that was um you know really favored Walmart and you're like why do you think they like Walmart so much said, well it's because they're being propagandized from the time they're children and you know propaganda works that's why it's still with us Probably World War II. I mean, I think World War II is the um, the bedrock for the world order that we live in today, um, when America decisively became the world superpower. And yes, the Soviets won the war also, but they were beat up bad in a way that we weren't, and we got the nuke, and th and that changed everything. And once that happened, it was. It, the, as, as Eisenhower, not a good guy, but he made one good point where he said, we have really created a military industrial complex now. And there was one already before, but not like it existed after World War II. And from that point, I think it was over. All the incentives were there. All, the, you know, the, all, all of the perverse incentives that are still with us today existed, and there was no going back, and the size of government was going to keep growing and growing and growing. And of course, there were, there, there's a lot of different points you could look to. You could look to um, the, the progressive era. You could look to the end of the prog progressive era in the New Deal. Of course, the Great Society, uh, look at the George W. Bush years, the Barack Obama years, the, now the Donald Trump years. But to me, World War II was really where it all went wrong. from the ancient Greek without rulers. That simple. To me, um, anarchism, synonymous with libertarianism, synonymous with abolitionism. It's this, the, the exact same thing. All an abolitionist said was that these people shouldn't be ruled. They shouldn't be slaves. There shouldn't be the slave-slave-master relationship. And to me, that's what an anarchist is. You want to abolish one central thing, and that's slavery. And sometimes people ask, you know, well, what, what does the libertarian say about this or about this? And our answer is always essentially nothing. We say that you shouldn't initiate violence against peaceful people. That's all we say. And, and that has a lot of implications, a lot of very important implications. But it's like asking an abolitionist, well, what do you say about what jobs the slaves should get after they're freed? Who cares? We should abolish slavery. You can do better. Humanity can do better. We've made improvements. If you were to, to tell somebody in 1840 that we were going to abolish slavery across the West in the next 25 years, it would have seemed crazy. People worried who would, build, uh, who would pick the cotton, just like they worry today who will build the roads. But we can go to a much better place. We can actually be morally consistent. You don't have to live in this world where you, you pick which criminal you think is going to be slightly better than the other one. We all know they're all criminals. We all know this. People don't like politicians. 
They don't, they, people know who they are and people just have to have the courage and they have to um, have the right people around them. And they, they have to read the right people and hear from the right people. And uh, that's why this documentary is so important.